I'm Gabrielle Bege. I am a senior associate with Necrosti Historic Advisors. We are a national historic consulting firm uh, with offices in DC, Boston, Chicago, Charleston, Houston, New Orleans, and San Jose. So I helped start the New Orleans office about three years ago. I think everyone comes to preservation in probably an unusual way and, and uh, not a straight line. And I find this a hard question to answer because I came to it gradually. But the moment, the perhaps the most concrete moment that comes to mind was is um, I was in a class many years ago at NYU when I used to live in New York many, many years ago. I had the pleasure of taking a History of the American Decorative Arts class with Wendell Garrett, who is a preeminent historian of American Decorative Arts. He passed away a few years later after that class, and so I felt extra grateful to get to study with him. And during that class, he mentioned that the director of the Decorative Arts Collection at the Metropolitan Museum of Art back in the 50s, I believe, said something along the lines of, well, there's nothing worth anything south of Baltimore. And I have been, as a New Orleans native, that it really stuck in my mind. And I thought, well, that is not true. And luckily, um, Professor Garrett agreed. And he talked about all the wonderful things, all the wonderful objects, including uh, cabinet making, for example, Creole cabinet making from the colonial period. Um, that were associated with New Orleans, for example, and that really lit the fire under me. Um, I had been away from home for a long time, and I thought, I know that there's plenty worth saving and valuing in my hometown, and I want to find a way to get there. And so through the decorative arts and understanding historic interiors and why we lived the way we do and worked and played versus how we live and work and play today, that is a ongoing, intriguing question for me that I get to answer in countless contexts through my work. Master's uh, in Historic Preservation from Tulane uh, University. Prior to that, uh, I, had, I, I received my undergraduate degree in French language and literature from New York University. I had set myself on a path to um, become an editor. That was my dream job. And I became an editor and realized it wasn't for me, even though it's a very, very important job. Um, everyone needs an editor, including me. Uh, so I started looking for a second career path. And actually, through my editing work, I discovered my love of American history and architectural history. I moonlighted as uh, a consultant for Princeton Architectural Press, for example. I got, I, got, I got exposure to a lot of different types of texts on this subject, and so I made my way to the master's program at Tulane and the rest is history. When I started the master's program in historic preservation at Tulane, I really had no idea what I wanted to do with that graduate degree afterwards. I was exploring all the various career options, and during my time as a student, I took every extracurricular opportunity I could to help me answer that question. I did internships and extra projects and met all sorts of professionals in various parts of the preservation field. And through that, I discovered that I was very interested in preservation consulting. It mixes research, writing, field work, and perhaps most importantly, you have this tangible product at the end of your project. You have a rehabilitated historic building that the community is excited about. It's put back into commerce. And often, you get the owner excited about the building's history too. So you have an opportunity to sort of spread the joy of preservation in a very tangible and practical way through these historic tax credit programs. So 
when I graduated, I discovered there was no one in New Orleans who could hire me as a company, as an employee, to do this type of work at that time. This was back in 2012 or 13. And so with a colleague of mine who was also in the graduate program, we said, hey, why don't we go out on our own and, and do this consulting work? And so we started a company called Clio Associates. And we started working on all sorts of projects, large and small, um, including historic tax credits, of course, also National Register, individual listings and districts, Section 106, preservation planning. And so we got a really a great broad exposure to all the various types of work that a preservation consultant can get involved in. Gained some really invaluable experience and I knew pretty much right away that it was the right, it was the right fit for me in terms of preservation work. And, I, and I'm, I'm still chugging along. No two days are alike in the historic consulting uh, field because you are juggling so many different projects and wearing a lot of different hats. So yes, you're on the computer a lot because you're researching and you're writing and you're emailing and you're communicating with your clients and other colleagues, um, but you're also out in the field documenting projects and doing research in archives. It's one of my favorite things to do is to get dusty in the archives, see what I can uncover um, that could set the project on an unforeseen path in a good way. The challenges that I have faced in my career are also part of what makes the career exciting and interesting. And what I mean by that is in preservation, there's so many different disciplines that come to bear in, on a project. And the consultant is dealing with many different people, many different professionals who are coming at the project from a different perspective. And the consultant is expected to have an understanding of all of those different professions and perspectives. And so because of that, I'm constantly learning and adapting, um, talking to attorneys, accountants, contractors, historians, academics, and of course, architects and designers and developers, real estate professionals. And so they're, they all have a different point of view and the consultant really needs to understand to a certain degree at least, I'm not gonna do your taxes, but um, what, where those people are coming from so that we can all uh, work together effectively. And so that is, I think managing expectations as a consultant, what you do as a consultant, what you don't do as a consultant, that's an ongoing challenge. Um, and I think part of that has to do with the fact that we as consultants come from various backgrounds ourselves and so we have different strengths. Some, Folks come from architecture, they were architects formerly, or they are historians, or they're business, they're really interested in the business side of things and, and the real estate development. So it, that is a challenge, but it's one, again, that keeps you learning. There are many rewarding parts of my job. I would say that the number one probably, and I think a lot of preservationists would agree, is seeing a building that was written off, left for dead, come back to life because of, in part because of our efforts. We contributed to this team effort to bring the building back to life, fill it with people again, and to and avoid, and we, and we helped avoid demolition of a building that and, and replacement with probably an inferior new construction building, sorry. Um, so that that's that's constantly the most rewarding part of the job. To just seeing seeing our buildings and our and therefore our communities too come back to life. Also related to that, seeing my team members and the community get excited about breathing new life into historic buildings, seeing that historic buildings have a lot more to offer than they might appear to at first glance. If 
if you want to break into the preservation field, I do think a master's program is a wonderful way not just to learn the ins and outs of what preservation means, but also it gives you an opportunity to meet all kinds of professionals that you might not otherwise have access to. So that, that to me was the, the best part of Tulane's master's program. Um, that's, I got a lot out of that. Also just reaching out to folks, uh, attending events that are related to historic preservation, um, especially highlighting ongoing projects where you can meet the players on the project team. Um, I, I know that some folks offer internships and apprenticeships, just depends on what aspect of preservation you really want to get involved in. Preservation consulting, internships, um, also, you know, anybody can submit a tax credit application. If your neighbor or a friend has a historic building that seems to be eligible for the tax credit program and they're planning some work on their building, go through the process. You can do this yourself. Same with National Register. That kind of practice is invaluable to understanding how the programs work and how you can apply that knowledge to other projects professionally down the road. So a current success story is, it's ongoing. It's the Dew Drop Inn on LaSalle Street in Central City in New Orleans. This is a extraordinarily historically significant building in 20th century history of Black New Orleans, New Orleans music, American music. But the buildings themselves are in rough shape. And to look at them at a glance, it looked like there's no way we could qualify these for sort of tax credits. They needed the, the two buildings, which were two residences that were joined together and modified over time, um, also needed to be individually listed in the National Register in order to qualify for the sort of tax credits. So we needed to get through these hoops in order to make the project even feasible. So other folks had tried and not gotten very far in previous years and the current owner and developer, Curtis Doucette, wanted to push things a little further and, and he got me involved and we, I, I believe strongly in just considering how historic this property is that we could make this work and it deserved to be individually listed in the register despite its appearance because of the culturally significant events that occurred there. So what we needed to do was to remove the non-historic facade from the building. And that was, a, that was a heavy lift at the time because my client wasn't the current owner. He was in the process of becoming the owner. And so the current owner at the time was the grandson of the founder of the Dew Drop In. And he was tentative, understandably. This is a big ask to remove all of this fabric from the facade and we didn't know what we were going to find underneath and how would that impact his property. But we worked as a team to make this happen and I tell you when that material came off and we could see the historic dewdrop underneath, everyone was over the moon thrilled. It was a very exciting moment and it was also what we needed to make the National Register listing happen. And so it's been deemed eligible by the National Park Service. We received a Part 1 approval, which was a huge step forward that no one had, had achieved thus far. And so we're expecting to get through the, the last steps of the National Register process over the next few months and look for an official listing uh, early in 2022. So as preservationists, we experience preservation losses regularly, unfortunately. Um, projects are not feasible for the developer. Natural, des natural disasters occur. There are various reasons why these losses happen. Um, from my perspective, professionally, I recently experienced a loss through Hurricane Ida I have been working with the new owners of the Karnowski's Taylor Shop to revitalize not just that building, but the entire block after many, many decades of neglect under previous ownership. And 
The interior of the Karnowski Steeler Shop had been stabilized, but sadly, it's standing there on its own, surrounded by service parking lots, and the ferocious winds of Ida took it out, and it's now a pile of rubble, and it is heartbreaking that these new owners were fully set to make this a, a gem, along with the other historic buildings on that block, just a gem of historic revitalization in downtown New Orleans. It was imminent, and here we have this natural disaster that just wiped this building out. And so we're in the process now of figuring out what we can do. Do we rebuild it? Do we reconstruct it? Is there any chance that historic tax credits can help? Uh, what's the status of its National Register listing? It just, these natural disasters, which unfortunately seem to be occurring more and more due to climate change, are, these are questions uh, the preservation community are gonna have to grapple with. And that, I'm, in the, I'm right in the middle of that. Hands down, the most important resource that I use as a historic consultant is the, on, the world of online newspaper databases. And related to that, databases like Ancestry, which give you access to city directories and census records. The amount of information available in, on these sites, which are sub subscription-based, it's just incredible. The, the ways that they can inform project research, National Register, um, we have found, you know, this is relatively new technology. A generation ago, consultants didn't have access to these databases. They had to look for this information on microfilm. And so, understandably, they missed some stuff. And this keyword search base is incredible we can find answers to questions that have people have been having about properties for decades it's it's in there somewhere we just have to find it and so that you can do a trial try it out you can also access some of these databases for free at the public library if you want to give them a shot um, also some universities have access as well so a wealth of information you can research your own house that way have fun with it